Okay, welcome attendees. Uh, welcome to this evening's Ascola Area and former Wordsmith Air Force Base PFAS update meeting. Um, turn my camera on. Uh, my name is Les Smith. I'm with the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. I'm going to uh, pass the microphone over here to Sue Menente with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Take it away, Sue. Thanks, Les. Hello, everyone. My name is Sue Menenti, as Les mentioned, and I'm with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, or we also call it MDHHS, and you probably know us uh, that way as well. Thank you for joining the meeting tonight. We're going to provide you with information and updates from the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes, and Energy, or we call them EGLE, on the Escota area and the former Wurtsmith Air Force Base environmental investigations. MDHHS and the Michigan Department of Natural Resources will also provide updates. And then we're going to hear from Purdue University about the Clark's Marsh Aquatic Ecosystem Study. Then we're going to open the meeting up to questions from you. In addition to our presenters, we have representatives from District Health Department number two and other staff from EGLE and the MDHHS agencies to hear your concerns and answer your questions. First, we're going to give you some information on using the webinar software and how to ask questions. Les, can you give us that information, please? Absolutely. Thank you, Sue. Uh, for many of you, if, if you've been on um, some of our previous Zoom meetings, um, just wanted to let you know that all of your lines are muted, which means um, hopefully you can hear us, but we won't be able to hear you. And I will and provide some information on how you can provide questions during tonight's meeting and how you can reach out to our panelists. Also, I want to remind everyone that uh, tonight's meeting is being recorded. Uh, once the meeting is uh, concluding, the conclusion of tonight's meeting, uh, the meeting uh, recording will be sent out for closed captioning. And then that uh, recording with the closed captioning will be posted on Eagle's YouTube channel and also on the MPART webpage. Now, um, for how you uh, ask questions for tonight, uh, there's multiple ways. Uh, you can type your question about any of the content tonight in, um, to our panelists uh, using the Q&A uh, question and answer box located in the bottom of your Zoom control panel. If you'd like to ask a question of our panelists tonight, you can use the hand icon. You can raise your hand uh, during the question and answer portion of tonight's meeting. And then a third option, and we do have at least three people that are on the phone this evening. Uh, for those of you that are on the phone who want to ask a question, you can electronically raise your hand by selecting the star and the number nine key on your phone that will electronically raise your hand. We'll see it here and uh, hopefully we'll be able to unmute you so you can um, ask your question. Um, we will revisit these uh, housekeeping slides uh, later on uh, when we get to the question and answer portion. And with that, I'll return it back to you, Sue. Thanks, Les. Before we get started, I'd like to ask if we have any local officials joining us who would like to introduce themselves. And we'll give you just a minute to raise your hand and Les will unmute you so you can make that introduction. I have one for you, Sue, and I'm un un working on Mr. Moss. All right. Uh, Mr. Moss, you're unmuted. Hi, my name is Jeff Moss. I'm an Asavo trustee. Thank you, Jeff. And do we have any legislative representatives joining us? And if so, if you would raise your hand and uh, Les will unmute you. Okay, I have uh, a Mr. Taser. Hello, um, my name is Robert Taser and I am uh, let's go to Township Planning Commission. Thank you, Mr. Um, Danger. Have a Mr. Keller. Good evening. Yes, this is Eric Keller. I'm with U.S. Senator Gary Peters' office. I'm his regional director. I'll be on the call. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, those anything? are all the those are all the hands I have raised at the moment. Okay. All right. Well, let's get started here. Um, our first speaker is Brandon Armstrong, who is with Eagle. Brandon, go ahead. Thanks, Sue. I'm Brandon Armstrong from the 
Technology and Eagle Orders Resource Division. And I'm going to give an update on a study that we're conducting in Lake Huron, trying to characterize the plume, potential plume of PFAS coming out of the Asable River. Next slide. Uh, just a brief introduction. The Asable River empties into Lake Huron in Asable Township, which is about six miles downstream of Clark's Marsh, where we have surface water and groundwater inputs uh, that with, and we know uh, there's contamination of PFAS in Clark's Marsh. Generally, Lake Huron will, uh, the surface water currents rotate in a counterclockwise fashion. So if there's a plume of PFAS coming out of the Osable River, there's potential for that plume to head south downstream towards the drinking water intake. The Huron Shore Regional Utility Authority is about 11 miles south of the river mouth. Next slide. So again, the objective of our study was to characterize the plume of PFAS coming off of the Asable River out into Lake Huron and to see how far out we see measurable concentrations of PFAS. Next slide. Uh, so we had two sites on the Asable River downstream of Ascoda, uh, where we collected surface water samples from the river. And we also had six transects out into Lake Huron. Four of those transects were near the river mouth, two north of the river, and two south of the river. And then we had two transects near Tawa City, bracketing the drinking water intake. So one north and one south of that drinking water intake. And then each transect started approximately 300 meters from the shore and extended out about 1.2 kilometers perpendicular to the shoreline. And then for each transect, we sampled three locations. And then at each location, we collected three water samples, one, one meter below the surface, one at the middle depth, and then one at one meter off of the lake bottom. Next slide. So this picture here shows those four transects near the Osalbo River mouth. And you'll see that we have, again, we have two north and two south of the river. And then those two red stars are our uh, river sampling locations. We collected a water sample at US 23 and then one at Mill Street. Next slide. Working our way south, you'll see near Tawas where we had those two transects bracketing that drinking water intake, which is denoted there by the red star. Next slide. Not only did we want to look at spatial variability of PFAS out in Lake Huron, we also wanted to look at the temporal variability. We wanted to account for potential seasonal differences that may occur throughout the year. So we collected samples in Ju July of 2019, September of 2019, November of 2019. And then we had intentions of going this out this past April to pick off spring runoff. However, due to COVID that was delayed. So we've rescheduled that for next April, April 2021. Next slide. That looks like the formatting got a little mixed up on these slides. Um, so and for the next few slides, we're gonna show you the concentrations of PFOS, PFOS, at each one of these transects. Uh, now, because of the formatting issue on the slide, it looks like the numbers are pretty small. But in July of 2019, the concentrations of PFOS in the Osable River were between 6.4 and 6.7 parts per trillion. Uh, you'll see there, um, and the, I guess it'd be the top right of your screen. Next slide. And then at each transect, we have three numbers that represent the concentration at the surface, the con or one meter below the surface, the concentration at the mid-depth, and the concentration one meter off the bottom. Next slide. Again, the formatting is a little mixed up. So <clears throat> the box should be highlighting the highest concentration that we found uh, in Lake Huron, which in, in July of 2019 was 3.6 parts per trillion PFOS. <clears throat> Next slide. Brandon, do you want me to point to that 3.6? Uh, yeah, if you can up, up here. <laughs> yeah, so that was a sample on the surface uh, in, a, in the transect that was just south of the river mouth there. 
Next slide. And then also in July of 2019, the highest concentration that we saw around the drinking water intakes was 1.4 parts per trillion PFOS. In September of 2019, the river concentrations of PFOS were lower than that of July of 2019. So if you remember in July, we, had, we saw concentrations between six and seven parts per trillion. In September, those concentrations were between two and three parts per trillion, so about half of that that we saw in July. And corresponding, uh, the highest concentration that we saw out in Lake Huron was 1.8 parts per trillion near the river. Next slide. Uh, one more. In November of 2019, the river concentrations were similar to that in September where we saw two, two to three parts per trillion coming out of the river. And our highest concentration out on Lake Huron was 2.4 parts per trillion in a transect north of the river. Next slide. And then in down by the drinking water intakes, our highest concentration of PFOS was 1.5 parts per trillion near the drinking water intake. Next slide. So overall, our concentrations out on Lake Huron were generally low. And when we say low, they're anything less than two parts per trillion are what we consider background. So when we go out and collect a water sample from a water body where we don't have a significant source of PFAS, we would typically find PFAS concentrations of around two parts per trillion or less. That's similar to what we're seeing out on Lake Huron. Uh, we did have the one sample in July of 2019 where we had the highest concentration of PFOS of 3.6 parts per trillion, and that was collected um, in a sample near the river at, towards the surface. Uh, it's important to note that we, for the purpose of this presentation, we focused on PFOS, PFOS. We did analyze for 28 total PFAS analytes. Generally, PFOA, PFOA was low, or less than two parts per trillion. Uh, we did see one concentration with an elevated uh, concentration of PFO of 3.9 parts per trillion. That was in a, a sample collected in September of 2019. And again, generally other PFAS were, were low or below reporting limit, uh, around five parts per trillion for some of those PFAS. And I think that's it. So I will turn it over to Ian, who will talk about the drinking water concentrations found at the Huron Shores Regional Utility Authority. Thanks, Brandon. So my part of the presentation is going to be fairly brief, but I will be around at the end to answer any questions that you all may have um, about this uh, information here or anything else with uh, relation to PFAS in Michigan's drinking water. Uh, we can go ahead and advance slide, please. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a timeline, so bear with me. Um, so in 2018, Eagle and MPART set out to do a statewide survey of PFAS in Michigan's uh, public drinking water supplies. And as part of that, we sampled every community water supply in the state that was not purchasing its water from another community water supply. In addition, we also sampled non-community water supplies, which were serving sensitive populations, including schools, child care, uh, Michigan Head Start programs, and, and others. Um, as part of that statewide survey, the Huron Shores Regional Utility Authority was sampled in 2018. And because uh, this supply utilized a surface water as a source, we actually took two sets of samples at that time. We sampled the raw intake water and then we sampled the finished uh, drinking water, so the treated water. Um, for that first sample, the raw water was analyzed utilizing um, a modified EPA method 537, um, which checked for 24 different PFAS compounds. Uh, for that first sample, we also ran the finished water using that method, as well as the EPA method 537, the, the non-modified version, which analyzed for, at the time, 14 compounds. Um, in all three of those 
uh, samples, we did not see detections. Oh, you can stay on that slide for a minute, Sue, thanks. In all three of those, we did not see detections for any of the PFAS compounds. Um, in 2019, we opted to go back to those supplies statewide who utilized surface water as a source. Um, we wanted to check for seasonal variability in PFAS levels um, to compare those to that initial sampling. Uh, again, here on shores was included in that sampling. We sampled from April through September 2019 monthly. And in each of those uh, six monthly samples, both raw and finished water, again, returned no detections for all compounds. Um, I will mention that moving forward, since August 3rd, uh, Michigan has had, in effect, uh, its, its own PFAS maximum contaminant levels. Um, so those MCLs are, are applied to those supplies which are covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act in Michigan, which again includes Huron Shores. So Huron Shores is going to be uh, required to sample under the Safe Drinking Water Act for seven PFAS compounds. Um, their, their initial sampling period began on August 3rd and closes on February 2nd. So during that six month period, they'll be taking an initial sample of finished water. And the monitoring schedule moving forward is going to be based on the results of that sample. So they'll either go on quarterly monitoring or annual monitoring based on the results of that sample and whether or not there are detections of any of those seven uh, PFAS MCLs. Um, I will also mention, it's not on the slide, but uh, we have also at, at Eagle and MPART secured funding to do some additional sampling of the raw water intakes statewide in 2021. That schedule has not yet been determined, but we will be returning to these supplies to do some additional raw water uh, sampling as well. We can go ahead and uh, jump to the next slide. Thanks, Sue. So this is just uh, a table of those seven sampling events that I mentioned. Uh, the November 15, 2018 is the initial sample. And then from April through the end of September 2019, those were the monthly uh, samples that were taken. And as you can see here, um, in every case, we had non-detect for all of those PFAS compounds for which we tested. I will mention there at the bottom, there's a link, michigan.gov slash PFAS response. That's the MPART website. And we do keep um, links to these results as well as updated PFAS results statewide on that website. So with that, we can go forward again and um, I will go ahead and hand it off to Beth and I look forward to any questions you may have a little bit later. Thanks everybody. Thanks Ian, um, I'm Beth Place. I'm the former Wart Smith Air Force Base Eagle Project Manager. And um, just a reminder so for some folks that may be new to the meeting, um, Eagle became uh, aware of PFAS contaminations or concentrations in groundwater in March of 2010 when Eagle staff performed sampling at the former fire training area on the base. However, Air Force is the lead cleanup agency for um, environmental restoration at the former base. Air Force to date has completed the PFAS preliminary assessment and they're currently planning the, and the site inspection, and they're currently planning the remedial investigation under CERCLA. Air Force has, a, has performed uh, three uh, removal actions so far and are currently planning uh, two interim remedial actions to expand treatment systems. Eagle, Air Force, and DHHS have recently been meeting to discuss um, the remedial investigation and interim remedial action scoping, which is basically planning sessions. And so the kickoff meeting occurred on August 20th. Um, a discussion about interim remedial actions occurred on October, 20, on October 7th. And recently we discussed the conceptual site model and data quality objectives for the remedial investigation on October 15th. The upcoming meetings will be coming up in October and November. And these include um, a follow-up meeting on data quality objectives where we'll be digging more into details 
a meeting specifically on the risk assessment, and then a meeting on potential ARARs. The next slides that I'm presenting are from the kickoff meeting on August 20th. And so uh, things have changed. And as uh, these meeting minutes become final, they'll be placed on um, michigan.gov slash wordsmith. And so, so far, um, only the meeting minutes from the August 20th meeting have been finalized, but I would look for um, additional meetings, uh, meeting minutes soon. Air Force will also be providing additional information uh, tomorrow evening at the Restoration Advisory Board for Wordsmith. Next slide, please. Thanks. And the initial goals for the remedial investigation are to determine the nature and extent of PFAS, PFOA, and PFBS in uh, multiple media on the base, um, determine mass transfer from the sources of PFAS contamination into groundwater, and um, conduct a human health and ecological risk assessment, and additionally collect data to support the feasibility study which is the next step in the circular process. And so those are the, the goals for the Air Force-led remedial investigation. Next slide, please. Okay. And for there, as I said earlier, um, Air Force is proposing two interim remedial actions, which is expanding some of the removal actions that have occurred in the past. And so that's an expansion of the central treatment system along Van Etten Lake and the objective of that will be to reduce concentrations of PFAS and PFOA entering Van Etten Lake. Next slide, please. And um, also expanding the pump and treat system in the fire training area to reduce concentrations of PFAS and PFOA entering Clark's Marsh. And again, just a reminder that um, these slides are from the kickoff meeting on August 20th. So Air Force, Eagle, and MDHHS have had uh, a few more discussions on this and we're still continuing to discuss um, the objectives. Eagle anticipates receiving the proposed plan for the interim remedial actions in November for um, the draft final for Eagle review. And again, the Air Force meeting is uh, tomorrow night. It's the Restoration Advisory Board meeting. Thank you. I'm gonna go turn it over to Amanda Armbruster to speak about the Oscoda area sites. All right, thank you, Beth. Um, like Beth said, my name's Amanda Armbruster. I'm a project manager and geologist uh, for Eagles Remediation Redevelopment Division. I am the project manager responsible for the Oscoda area sites that aren't directly associated with the former Wordsmith Air Force Base contamination. You go ahead and go to the next slide, Sue. Um, we are currently conducting quarterly groundwater monitoring at several of the Oscoda area sites throughout the community. Um, this figure right here depicts the location of several of the monitoring wells that we utilize to do that quarterly sampling. And I'm going to go ahead and go through individual um, locations that you can see in boxes on this figure. Um, there'll be blown up versions of where we've conducted the sampling. Um, and it, there'll also be results of the most recent event that we conducted in July of this year. So go ahead and advance to the next slide. Um, this first location is, is what we call the Cold Bath Road area. It's in the northwestern portion of Van Etten Lake. Uh, it's an area where we believe that there was a residential fire that may have been fought with um, PFAS containing firefighting foam. Um, in July, we sampled two monitoring wells in this location and one of those monitoring wells um, exceeded the, our drinking water cleanup criteria for PFOS. Um, go ahead and advance to the next slide. This depicts the Cedar Lake area. Um, this is the southern end of Cedar Lake. In July, we sampled two monitoring wells in this location. We don't have a known source of, of contamination um, for this area. 
Uh, and we did have some detections of PFAS, but neither well that we sampled were above cleanup criteria. Go ahead and advance. Okay, this is the Loud Drive area. This is uh, again adjacent to Van Etten Lake, um, the, the southeastern portion of Van Etten Lake. Uh, we sampled seven uh, monitoring well locations, and two of those locations near the southern end of the lake were above our cleanup criteria. Go ahead and advance. Uh, this is the Ascoda Schools area. Um, also refer to it as River Road or Pinecrest because there's a small residential neighborhood across the street from the school. Um, and this area is also believed to or known to be associated with a fire that was fought on school property um, that utilized um, foam, um, PFAS containing foam. We sampled five locations in July and three of those locations exceeded our cleanup criteria. Go ahead and advance. Um, this last figure depicts uh, four locations that we sampled in Osable Township. Um, of the four, one exceeded cleanup criteria. Uh, this particular location is believed to be in an area where we have um, where municipal water is currently available, and it's not depicted on this figure. Uh, but in a location near the mouth of the Osable River. There's an area that we also sampled 10 locations. Um, we refer to it as the Smith Street area because it's near Smith Street. Um, of the 10 loca uh, locations that were sampled in that area, I believe three of them were above our cleanup criteria. But again, that's an area that's currently serviced by municipal water. Um, and that's all I have to present for now. Um, feel free to ask questions at the end. And our next presenter is Puneet Veach uh, with Department of Health and Human Services. Thank you. Hi, uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Puneet Veach and I'm a toxicologist with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. Next slide, please. Okay, um, I'll start with explaining the role of MDHHS. Um, our primary role is to understand the health concerns facing the community. We closely work with Eagle and other agencies to investigate the contaminated sites. With Eagle, we develop a plan to investigate and address health risks where Eagle leads the site investigation and MDHHS and, and local health uh, department leads the public health planning and response. We also evaluate PFAS or other contaminants exposure to residents in the community and recommend any public health action as needed. Next slide, please. Most of what we know about the toxicity of PFAS comes from studies of two specific compounds, P4 and P4, where P4 stands for perfluorooctanoic acid and P4 stands for perfluorooctane sulfonic acid. Adverse health effects have been established in epidemiological and laboratory animal model studies for these PFAS uh, compounds. These, uh, this slide provides some of the adverse health effects in humans associated with higher PFAS exposure from epidemiological studies, which includes lowering a woman's chance of getting pregnant, increasing the chance of high blood pressure in pregnant women, increasing the chance of thyroid disease, increasing cholesterol levels, change in the immune response, and increase in chances of cancer, especially kidney and testicular. Next slide, please. As there are many applications of PFAS, this slide explains different routes of PFAS exposure. The most significant route of exposure is ingestion, which is mostly through drinking PFAS contaminated water. It can also be through eating fish or wild game caught from a contaminated water body. So we evaluate fish levels in fish fillet along with other chemicals and issue fish consumption guidelines as needed. It, uh, if the PFOS levels are high as PFAS tends to bioaccumulate in fish, we, we issue do not eat advisory according to that. Incidental swallowing of PFAS contaminated soil or dust um, eating food out of packaging materials that contains PFAS, use of consumer products that contains PFAS, and research is still ongoing, but the current science indicates that skin contact with PFAS is not typically a concern, 
as these chemicals are not easily absorbed through the skin. Yeah, next slide, please. I'll talk a bit about MDHHS screening levels, health-based values or approved MCLs, and MDHHS comparison values. MDHHS developed screening levels in April 2019, and screening level is the amount of a chemical at or below which there is small to no risk of health effects in the people who are exposed. In July 2019, the Science Advisory Work Group developed health-based values for the development of PFAS MCLs under MPART's executive. These were the proposed MCLs, and they were finalized in August 2020 and is being used to regulate and enforce PFAS levels in drinking water in Michigan. The MDHHS comparison values are the lowest of these two, screening levels as well as approved MCLs. And we use this lower value to guide our public health recommendations. As a result, data above these comparison values often trigger a precautionary public health response, such as distribution of filters. Although the water may be fine to drink in that situation, but this ensures a, a, a resident's continued protection while the investigation continues. Next slide, please. MDHHS resampling effort is to understand PFAS fluctuations in drinking water wells. Currently, uh, we finished the first phase of resampling in August, and the next phase of resampling will start uh, somewhere uh, early next year. And we have collected samples from 272 wells out of 427 wells that were previously tested by Eagle. We have results from 272 residential wells in the Oscoda area. And out of those, we have 133 non-detects, 118 detections, but less than the comparison value, and, and uh, 20 detections that exceeds the comparison values in the Oscoda area. Also, I have been calling residents to inform them about their results and providing uh, all the recommendations. Next slide, please. This slide highlights the do not eat advisories in Clark's Marsh. Um, in 2012, MDHHS issued an emergency do not eat fish public health advisory for all fish taken from Clark's Marsh due to high levels of PFOS measured in, in fish fillet and is still in effect. In the fall of 2018, MDHHS issued a do not eat public health advisory for deer taken uh, from within five mile radius of Clark's Marsh, which is also in effect. The advisory uh, was issued as a precaution due to high levels of PFOS found in muscle and organs of one deer out of 20 tested in the Oscoda area. And more recently in December, 2019, MDHHS issued a do not eat public health advisory for all resident aquatic and semi-aquatic wildlife taken from the Clark's Marsh. MDHHS also recommends no one should eat organs from any fish, deer, and other wild game in the state because many chemicals, including PFAS, can accumulate in these organs. Consumption of fish or wildlife caught from Clark's Marsh is, is a concern, but in case of fish, catch and release is fine. Um, in regards to fish sampling updates, um, Eagle received uh, results this August for fish collected in 2019 from Cedar Lake uh, and bluegill and pumpkin seed uh, fillet had non-detectable levels of PFOS. We are also awaiting PFAS and mercury results for fish collected from Clark's Marsh in, in February 2020 and from Manhattan Lake. Uh, next slide, please. In, in regards to MDHHS exposure assessment, uh, we are in the beginning stages of planning. Uh, this exposure assessment would likely look like uh, MDHHS testing for PFAS in blood in exposure assessment participants and asking those participants to complete a survey. Uh, we'll be reaching out uh, to community members soon uh, to have additional con uh, conversations regarding this. Next slide, please. The, uh, okay. So uh, I'll give, uh, now I'll give the virtual podium to Tammy, uh, who is from Michigan Department of Natural Resources. Thank you. Hi there, thanks Puneet. Good evening everybody. So I'm just gonna do a little bit of an introduction uh, for our guests this evening. 
When we started looking at the Clark's Marsh issue and the Huron River issue related to um, fish contamination, wildlife contamination from PFAS, particularly Clark's Marsh, the DNR looked at it with um, eyes of opportunity to learn from what the circumstances presented in both this marsh-like environment and then in Huron River, this big complex flowing environment. And when I say learn from the environment, there's so many things that we don't understand about PFAS. We don't fully understand how it moves up through the food chain. We don't understand where it might be residing um, within the ecosystem itself that we might not be aware of. And understanding these things and understanding how rates of transfer from one food level to the other may happen will help us think about uh, things that we may need to monitor in the future. It helps the DNR think about policies related to fish and wildlife management. It helps us understand if any of, um, or it helps us understand the, the potential impact of any mitigation measures that are out there as, um, as amounts of PFAS, let's say in surface water may decline. And I'm speaking just generically right now. So uh, DNR received a little bit of funding in our budget a couple of years ago, and we did a competitive, uh, what's called an RFP, a request for proposals, a competitive request for proposals. And we um, got a few proposals in, and Purdue University was the, the selected applicant from those proposals. So Dr. Wes Flynn and Dr. Jason Hoverman are here tonight to present to you what their study is about. They don't have results yet, but we thought it was a good time to bring them in let you see what they're, um, what they're working on, let them talk about what the potential outcomes are for it and allow you the opportunity to answer questions. Um, they will come back uh, and, and tell us the results of their study. I do wanna say they are independent scientists working with Purdue University. DNR does not put any kind of sideboards on their research. We had a question, a work, uh, a, a research question that we wanted to have answered. And so that is what they're setting out to do. So they are objective scientists in their own right. And, um, and that's important for us because we wanna honor that uh, scientific method and honor the results of, of their work as independent um, expert results. So with that, Wes, can you share your slides now and get started? Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, I guess swap that. Okay, is that working? Yes, it is. All right. Yeah, thanks for having us here. Um, it's nice to be able to give an overview of uh, who we are and uh, what we're doing up there right now. So basically, uh, I'm going to be talking about <clears throat> the work we're doing with PFAS and the aquatic food web um, at Clark's Marsh. And this is part of, I'm doing this work with a larger group. So we have Jason Hooverman, who's here tonight, as well as other um, principal investigators on this. So Linda Lee, who's a faculty at Purdue, who's an analytical chemist, and Marisol Sepulveda, who is a toxicologist who's also a professor at Purdue. Um, we have some research staff that are helping with that. Matt Hamilton's been helping with field work. Masa and Chloe are both analytical chemists. And since we've been working up there, um, we've been collaborating and working with both Michigan DNR and Michigan EGLE. And so our current funding and what we're gonna be talking about um, is our work we're doing for Michigan DNR. Um, but we started doing some work a few years ago um, with some funding we had received from Purdue's Center for the Environment. And as a group, so we have a lot of different um, expertise in the group we have. Um, not any one of us can really do it all. Um, but among us, uh, we have a lot of experience with aquatic ecology, toxicology, environmental chemistry, and ecosystem ecology. And our groups uh, looked at a lot of stuff, looking at the effects of contaminants 
on wildlife, um, including PFAS, as well as coal ash, herbicides, and fungicides. And most of these projects involve some sort of collaboration with a state or federal agency. And a lot of the studies we do are looking at different routes of exposure um, for animals. So aquatic, dermal, or dietary exposure, and looking at effects on biological communities out there in the environment, um, as well as more individual effects, I say on survival, growth, and development. So that's just a little bit about our backgrounds. And so the rest of the time, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview of what we have going on at Clark's Marsh. So a little background, tell you what our objectives are, the rationale for the study, um, how we're going about this, and what we um, expect to have for deliverables. So a lot of you are probably uh, fairly familiar with PFAS, um, but so they're used in all kinds of different things. So they've been very useful um, since they're developed in the 40s in all kinds of consumer and industrial applications. Uh, the most prevalent that we tend to find out in the environment are PFOS and PFOA, but there are lots and lots of others. And recently, so these things have been developed since the 40s, but it's really been over the last 15 or so years where there's been a really um, rapid increase in research that's been happening um, when people were seeing that these things tend to stick around in the environment and uh, accumulate in humans and wildlife. And so folks have been getting more and more interested in trying to evaluate what the potential for effects on health and what they do when they get in the environment. Um, and so one of those applications also happens to be um, aqueous film forming foams, um, which you may be familiar with, and all these other applications. And this map here at the bottom <clears throat> is from a paper that tried to summarize uh, where PFAS have been detected in surface water throughout the United States. And you can see all those blue dots and blobs on that map there um, are where PFAS were detected um, and there were data for back in 2016. There's a lot of area that shows not detected, um, but there's also a lot, just a, not a lot of data uh, for a lot of places right now. And so this brings us to the Clark's Marsh Wildlife Area, um, which is adjacent to the former Wordsmith Air Force Base. And so I have a little um, drawings on there, um, which is where we're doing our work down there in the marsh. And so you've probably seen in other slides, um, the amount of PFAS in the water tends to be the highest um, at the top of the marsh there, and it decreases pretty rapidly um, as you go down the marsh and towards the river. So our primary objectives were to determine where PFAS were accumulating in this ecosystem. Uh, there's a lot of different organisms there. Also assess which PFAS were accumulating as we mentioned, uh, there's a lot of different PFAS out there and PFOS and PFOA um, are just two of them. So we'd like to get an idea of if there's any others that seem to be accumulating. Identify some, may, any major contributors to PFAS accumulation in different wildlife species and potentially identify any source, potential sources of PFAS transfer from aquatic to terrestrial systems. So thinking about the rationale for this, and so why is it important to understand how PFAS behave in an aquatic system? <clears throat> so we have here uh, kind of a conceptual diagram of a food, an aquatic food web. And so we have PFAS, and think about these compartments as where PFAS might be. Um, so we have some in the water, and that interacts with the sediment. Um, but we have all these other components of the system, including primary producers, so all the algae and plants, the thing that, things that eat the uh, plants, so the primary consumers, 
the things that eat those primary consumers, so things like crayfish, turtles, small fish, as well as the larger um, animals in the system, say um, largemouth bass. So all of these things have the potential to be exposed to PFAS if it's in the water. And we can see that with these uh, arrows here. But since this is a system um, and all these things work together, all these dotted lines show um, potential dietary sources. So these animals are potentially exposed through the water as well as the other animals that they're eating out there. And there's not a whole lot of data right now about how these interactions occur um, or which chemicals um, might move through better into certain organisms. And so some things that we can think is missing from this. So we're look, thinking about Clark's Marsh or, or any system like this, and we're thinking about the aquatic environment, but it, it doesn't stand alone. So we also have this terrestrial environment um, that's right next to it. And those things are linked by both the water um, for things that use the water to grow or to drink, as well as or organisms that live on land to potentially consume organisms in that aquatic habitat. So by examining what's happening and who's eating who and where these chemicals could be accumulating, we can get a good idea of how these things might be moving into different environments. Thinking about the different chemicals, so these chemicals, uh, PFAS, are found all over the world, and they're almost always present as these mixtures of different chemicals. And on the right here, you can see this. Um, you don't need to pay attention to the colors, but this is from a recent paper looking at PFAS at um, different Air Force bases around the country. And we can see, this is from surface water, that there are potentially a lot of different PFAS chemicals uh, present. And most of them we don't know a whole lot about. Um, so we know that carbon chain lengths, so what these chemicals look like, the structure of them can affect accumulation. Um, but we also see a lot of variation among species um, that's less clear. And there's also a few uh, PFAS out there that can be transformed into different PFAS to further complicate everything. So it's a pretty complex question, um, and we're hoping this study will do a lot to get us a better idea of what's happening, not only for Clark's Marsh, but everywhere else um, that experiences these types of issues. And so to do this, um, it's pretty straightforward. So we go out there and we collect along this gradient that you can see on the map, um, this concentration gradient, we collect water, sediment, and biota. So the different plants and animals that are out there. And we do this with dip netting. Um, so you can see a student that was helping me out with a dip net there to collect things or putting out minnow traps or hoop nets to passively collect animals. And then take these back to the lab and we're really doing two different things with them. Looking at the stable isotope composition, which really is just determining who eats who, and looking at the accumulation of the standard set of 24 different PFAS. And we're gonna use those um, to create some statistical and conceptual models. Here's, I just included a list of the, some of the species we've been collecting. They encompass everything from plants, invertebrates, amphibians, and fish. And so this is kind of reiterating, I think, what I already said, but we really are trying to determine how PFAS accumulation might differ among species and down along this concentration gradient as it goes from high concentration to low. Um, try to get estimates of major sources of PFAS exposure and accumulation for different species and develop tools uh, to help facilitate long-term monitoring efforts and provide stakeholders uh, with some recommendations on where uh, problems might be. And that was all I had. Thank you. And I 
back and back over. Okay, Sue, so you just have to share your screen. Yeah, thank you. I was having a little trouble um, unmuting there. <laughs> you can see my screen now. Uh, not yet. Oh. Okay, there we are. Great, thank you. All right, so now we would like to hear from you and learn about your questions and concerns. You've heard a lot of information and we do, we have received some questions already. Uh, we are going to give you instructions again for using the webinar software. And um, before we do that, I'd like to ask you to take a, a little poll. We're interested in knowing how many people are with you at this meeting? Trying to get a sense of uh, how many people might be attending virtual meetings versus public meetings. And obviously we can't hold public meetings yet, but um, we'd just like to look at some numbers of how many people might be attending this meeting. So if you are good with uh, giving us that information, if you just take a minute and check a number in this poll. And Sue, they are responding. So I'm just gonna give it a little bit of time here. Uh, we've got about 68% of those in attendance voting right now, so. Great, thank you everyone. Be able to, hopefully you can share this here soon. Okay, kind of stabilized here. So I'm gonna end the poll and share the result. Uh, can you see that, Sue? Yeah, I can see it. Okay. Yep. okay. Yeah, thanks everyone. Appreciate that. All right, so now uh, we're going to give you the, the instructions again on how to um, ask a question in Zoom. So Les, if you could run through that again, please. Sure. Okay, uh, just a quick reminder, and many of you have uh, have done this already. Uh, if you have questions for tonight's panelists, and we had several, and just to thank you to all the panelists that spoke already this evening. Uh, if you have questions for the panelists, uh, please type your questions in the Q and A box. And those that you that have already, thank you. Uh, we do see them, and we'll be addressing those here shortly. Um, another option is to raise your hand uh, by collect by clicking the hand icon that is also located in the Zoom control panel. We have a couple of people already who have uh, have their hands raised at the moment. And then um, we have a total of so far about five people who are on the phone. So for our listeners who are on the phone right now, if you have a question for tonight's panelist, um, you can electronically raise your hand by selecting star and the number nine. And we will try to get to you um, so we can get your mute, your lines unmuted so you can talk to the panelists. So there are your options there. And Sue, um, I'll turn it back over to you. All right. I do see we have Jake Bennett with a hand raised. Um, Jake, can't, we'd like to hear from you, please. I, I was just going to mention that I was on today. I had some problems when we first logged on, so I wasn't able to mention that I was on. But I just want to say that I'm here today. OK. And Jake Bennett is with Congressman Kildee's office. Thank you, Jake. All right, we do have some questions and I will read the questions to you and uh, pretty much gonna so, go in the, yeah. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention, um, I have uh, working with us behind the scenes, Matt Tomlinson, so we will both be monitoring for the questions as they come in. So I just wanted to announce that we have Matt Tomlinson with us this evening. Great, thank you. All right, let's get started with these questions. Uh, we have a question from Rex and Brandon, I think this is for you. Rex would like to know if any hexane sulfonate was found in the lake samples. Yeah, so we analyzed the Lake Huron and Osceola River samples for 28 PFAS analytes, uh, PFHXS, uh, perfluorohexane sulfonic acid was one of those analytes. 
Uh, we did find it out in the lake. Uh, the concentration, I think the highest concentration we saw was 1.8 parts per trillion. And then in comparison to the rivers, uh, where we saw a con highest concentration of 3.3 parts per trillion. Okay. And this next question is for you as well from William. What is the depth of the drinking water intake and where is that intake in relation to the southern transects? Ian probably can speak to the depth of the drinking water intake. Uh, I'm not sure on that. Uh, those two transects that we had um, now down by Tawas, they were north and south of the intake. I'm not sure on um, you know, approximate location, how close they were to the actual intake. Uh, Ian, are you available for, to answer that one? Yep, um, I believe the intake is approximately 40 feet depth or 40 foot depth. And I think I saw the location, the approximate location on one of the slides. Yeah, that's right. Um, if you can, Sue, if you want to go back to that map, yeah, show maybe the best locations. Best chance at a, a good approximation. Right. I think it's, yeah, it's a little closer to transect two. Yeah, keep if going. you keep going back. Yep. Oh, I wonder if it's no, behind keep the going. I can, yeah, if I a, can. Share it's my in the screen. methods. So if you go back a little bit further, I'll oh. show you where that intake was. Those are all the slides I have. Oh no, there we go. There go. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so that red star there indicates the location of the intake and then how we bracketed the those two transects to the south. <clears throat> okay, thank you. This is also a question for Eagle. I'm not sure who should answer it. It's from Connie. Did Eagle do any sediment sampling for PFAS in the Osawa River or near shore at Lake Huron? Yeah, I guess I can address I, that. I um, could answer that, uh, okay. Mike Jury. So yes, the answer was, is yes. In October of 2018, six samples were taken, three in the river and three at the river mouth area, and all samples were non-detect. Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, and another question from Connie. Is there any local citizen or environmental group representation on the Restoration Advisory Board, or is it only government reps? No, I can answer that one, Sue. This is Beth. Um, right now, now I believe it's Kathy, Kathy Woosterbarth, who is on the Restoration Advisory Board. OK, thank you. Thanks, uh, Sue. Can you um, turn your camera on? I'm sorry. Oops, do I have you, Les? I don't, I don't see you yet. I just wonder if you could turn your, your camera on. I am looking for my taskbar. Um, you're sharing your screen, so we'll be at the top. It's hiding from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not coming up with it, Les. Okay, all right. Well, go, go ahead with your questions. <laughs> oh, got it back. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, a question from Rex. Are the fish tissue sample results available for Cedar Lake? Uh, we did get results back for bluegill and pumpkin seed that were collected in 2019 from Cedar, <clears throat> Cedar excuse me, Cedar Lake. Uh, PFOS was not detecting those samples. And we currently have yellow perch uh, collected from the lake that we'll, we will be sending to the lab shortly. So those results will, will probably be available um, early next year. Okay, thank you. And we have a question from uh, Greg. Where can I find contact information for the presenters? 
And Greg, there's a slide at the end that I'll move to that has the contact information for the presenters. I don't know that we have Ian's contact information there, but we can post that in the chat, I believe. All right, a question from William. The Do Not Eat Advice website says PFOS is not mutagenic, yet your slides reference liver and kidney cancer. Please comment on the difference between your slide and the Do Not Eat Advice. So we need, that seems like a question for you. Yes, uh, my slide, uh, yes, it, it mentions liver and kidney uh, cancer. Um, although PFAS chemicals, they don't really appear to be mu mutagenic, but there are both uh, human as well as animal research studies that have demonstrated that uh, there have been increases in incidence of some cancers, especially kidney and testicular. Um, and apart from being mu mutagenic, there can be other me mechanisms uh, through which a chemical can increase the incidence of cancer. So. Okay, thank you, Panit. No and we have a question from an anonymous attendee. We're hoping to get an update on who is eligible for residential well testing at no cost. How is it determined who is eligible for free testing? I can take that one too. Okay. Um, it really depends if you are in the area of concern. Um, and if you are, then uh, as a part of our resampling effort, we, we, uh, we offer um, you a free testing. Uh, but yes, it really depends if, uh, in which area you are. Okay. Thanks, Puneet. Um, I would like to go over to Grace, who's had her hand raised for a while. Matt or less. Okay, just a moment. I will. I have her. Uh, Grace, your mic is unmuted. There you go. Yeah. Can you? Okay. You can hear me. Okay. This is uh, Craig Miner, Grace's dad. So we're both here watching. I'm the one here who has the question. Uh, first off, good job on all the briefings. Uh, very informative. Uh, my first question I had was uh, uh, quickly for uh, Beth. So uh, the question I have, Beth, is that I noticed that um, uh, all the work that's going on, uh, I just saw this report that came out from the RRSE, the Relative Risk Side Evaluation, and I noticed the map uh, detailing the, uh, what is considered the worst, uh, the worst PFAS or AFFF uh, locations, uh, doesn't include what is really known as the worst two areas, and that's the operational apron that's uh, impacting Bennett and Lake, and the, uh, the base sanitary system location that is really the main source uh, for the hottest piece that's uh, impacting uh, Clark's Marsh. Uh, could you, would you care to impact or uh, comment on that? Um, sure, um, give me just a second to pull that up. We're dialing in from Ohio, so we're probably a little far from you all. <laughs> it doesn't matter anymore. <laughs> Virtual. Yeah, <things>. You're right. <laughs> we're down here by Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, okay. So I'll do my uh, best to answer your question, and then if I need to follow up afterward, I certainly okay. can. Um, the areas were combined in the RRSE, so there's four main um, site groupings that you'll see. And um, I would have to go to our crosswalk, which is a which is also available in um, the RAB slides. The RAM, RAB members have access to those slides. And I don't know if they're out public publicly yet from the Air Force, but they are with the RAB. And so the Air Force used um, a, essentially a combination of areas and they captured several of the AFFF areas within those four sites. Gotcha. So I, I just, uh, we probably should talk offline because uh, these sites that are listed here are probably the less benign sites. And I'm familiar with exactly what caused these contaminations. 
Um, but the key ones that were the systemic uh, contaminations uh, since P triple F arrived on the base up until it closed in 1993 are really not listed here. And it's uh, probably something that we, sh we should talk about at some point, if you don't mind. Um, sure, we can definitely talk um, if you want my, and I'm not sure if um, I'd have to talk with you further to determine if, if you're, what you're saying is. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, but, have, uh, we can yeah, I have a lot of literature on this and a lot of, all this is actually a matter of record. So it's just not me speaking. So it's, it's easy to cite. Um, so, but I, I appreciate, uh, appreciate that. I think I have your contact information. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll send an, an email or something to start the conversation later. Okay, that sounds great. Thank you. I had a quick question for uh, Panit. Um, I noticed that you listed out um, your uh, toxicological impacts, um, but I was uh, first thing I noticed right off the bat that it uh, doesn't match EPA's uh, toxicological stuff, and it doesn't uh, quite uh, necessarily square with some of the stuff we're seeing from the C8 panel. I'm I'm curious as to uh, uh, how you arrived at that uh, at uh, that list of things. For example. I noticed that uh, developmental effects in fetuses during pregnancy uh, weren't, wasn't listed. Uh, liver effects wasn't listed. Um, do you have any comment on that? L liver effects was uh, on my slide. Oh, was it? I, I didn't see it. I, I, uh, no, I apologize. He no, I'm, I'm just asking you. you, you mentioned liver effects. It was not listed on my, uh, on my slide. That's Is correct. That it question? wasn't listed. Or the, yeah, or the developmental effects in fetuses, you know, skeletal, those kinds of things. Okay. Uh, all, all the effects, all the major ones were uh, from, dif uh, from different epidemiological studies. Those uh, I have listed uh, on, on the slide. Okay. That's yeah. all right. I, I, I've read nearly every one of them. So I, and I noticed that that's not what's published on the EPA site. So I was just curious as to what the difference was. And okay. so just, just putting that out there. And, and, that, and then a quick question, have you used uh, the pharmacological equation to, uh, to take uh, uh, the uh, PFAS levels that are in blood serum today to uh, go backwards and, and uh, approximate uh, uh, how much of this was consumed in the past, like at the base, uh, veterans and that kind of thing? I have not been involved in that. Uh, I, yeah, I have not been a part of that. Okay, I was just curious. Okay, that was it. Uh, and then one last one was for uh, Wes. Um, I noticed that you said in the last 15 years, you know, this was just popping up, uh, the consumption of PFAS, obviously we know that drinking it's the, the bad way to get it um, in the last 15 years, but I know that the Center for Disease Control and Prevention has published uh, quite extensively the amount of PFAS is, you know, the top five that are in blood serum dating all the way back to 1998. And as most people know, in 2002, they, they uh, uh, stopped manufacturing, at least on the 3M side, the, the PFAS that were the the, the unhealthy stuff in AFFF in 2002, and then the national numbers have, have plummeted since then. So I, I just, I, I know that a lot of these things have been uh, appearing in animals and that kind of thing, but there's, uh, uh, it's a matter of record and we know positively that uh, uh, the veterans uh, that lived on uh, Wordsmith Air Force Base uh, uh, from 1985, actually March of 1985, and 1993 when it closed actually drank uh, PFAS and it was from a disposal site that was just a few hundred yards uh, from the three main wells supplying all the water to the base. So uh, a lot of interesting stuff out there in the official record and just wanted to make you aware of it. That's it for me. Yeah, thank you for those comments and questions. Can I just say something real quick in response sure. to Sure, and who is this? Wes. Okay, Wes, go ahead, please. Um, yeah, I appreciated the comment. I might have um, misspoke. The comment about the last 15 years I had in the slide 
um, had to do with the increase in research. So I didn't mean to say that there hadn't been uh, PFAS research before that. Um, but over the last 15 or 20 years, the number is somewhat arbitrary. There's just been a lot more funding and research happening. Okay, great. Thanks. Oh, and so before we move on, mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to mention something further on the relative risk site evaluation that uh, Air Force completed. Um, I just wanted to remind folks that that's not a substitute for a baseline risk assessment. That'll be um, occurring during the remedial investigation. And then it's used as an internal screening method at um, Air Force. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. All right, our next question is from Jennifer. And I think this is for you, Wes. Can you please address the timeline for being able to share results to the wildlife sampling study that was talked about today? Thank you. Hey, Sue, this is Tammy. I'll take care of that one. Our contract, okay. um, with um, Purdue ends in September of 2021. So we're anticipating a report from them, a final report from them within three months of that uh, ending date for their research. Um, I wanna say that Purdue was able to keep moving forward. And even though we offered to them an extension uh, for their work because of COVID, it stopped so many things. And actually they were just able to squeeze in under the wire, their field sampling for this year when, when folks finally got released to go back out in the field. So we're looking at um, fall of, of 2021. Thanks, Tammy. And we do have a question from William asking when we're, will Purdue be uh, publishing data? I'm assuming um, your answer has addressed that question as well. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, question um, from an anonymous attendee uh, about Lake Huron testing. Please explain why samples were not taken from the surface of the water as it seems this is where the PFAS is located. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so I wasn't involved in the design of this actual study, but I can speak to our typical protocol for surface water sampling. Uh, usually we avoid collecting surf, uh, water right directly from the surface to avoid a lot of the scums that may be floating on top. Uh, and I know in speaking with some of the lab technicians, you know, when you have a high concentration of scum, that can impact not only the detection limits and the reporting limits in the samples. So we typically try to go below the surface when we collect our samples. All right, thank you. Another question from Anonymous. Could we get the slides in advance of the town halls in the future? It's difficult to review information that quickly to formulate questions. It's something we could look at. I know we often um, uh, have edits that we're making to slides close to the time of the, of the presentations and it does take a bit of time to post them, but thank you for the question. It's something we can look at. All right, a question from Marsha. These PFAS chemicals will be replaced with shorter chain PFAS at airports. Presuming the shorter chains will break up quicker, will they also be more permeable to the skin? I can take this one, yep. Yeah. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, skin permeation is typically not a concern, uh, but a different PFAS like shorter chain or longer chain they behave differently for skin permeability. And we evaluate uh, all this based on the available information. Um, of, uh, if we have the information regarding skin uh, permeability, which is not readily available for most of the PFAS. So we need more research uh, to answer this question, uh, how it's gonna make a difference. Okay, thanks Puneet. Yeah. And a question from Bentley. As we heard, there are places in the state, including Clark's Marsh, where we can't eat the fish. Given the contamination from direct plumes, as well as background contamination, does this mean that we can expect fish will be unsafe to eat in these water bodies for years to come? If new contamination now, how long would it take uh, for fish to be safe to eat? An estimate. I can try to answer uh, 
small part of it. Uh, we need a lot of data, like at least two to three years of data to make sure uh, we are receiving non-detects or below our criteria uh, to reduce uh, it from do not eat fish. Uh, Brandon, do you want to add something? Yeah, I can, I can take that. Um, so in other areas of the state where we have found a source and, and reduced the source uh, discharging to a river, we have seen dramatic decreases in PFOS concentrations in the fish. Uh, for example, in 2018, we found high concentrations um, in, of PFOS in, in fish from the Huron River. And in the same year that uh, source was identified and uh, reduced, and just this past year, we saw in 2019, pretty, pretty significant drop. Um, but as Panit said, we, the DHHS requires at least two years of data showing significant reductions in PFOS before they'll update the advisory, um, that just to avoid that a yo-yo effect in, in the advisory. And this is Tammy. I want to add the third part to that. Um, Cause that's an excellent question. And that's the question that uh, DNR has been looking at and looking to see how we could provide information to help with that. How do you project into the future given what you have? I mean, we all have what we measure, but what can we think about into the future as well as looking for where reservoirs in the food chain might be lying. For example, maybe the it's not so high in the surface water anymore, but we're still measuring it in fish or some other organism, let's say. Um, the work that we're doing now with Purdue University and then with Michigan State University and the Huron River is going to help us build those type of models to be able to do some of that production. I just, I just wanted to say I really understand and appreciate your question, and that's exactly what's sort of on the back of our mind from an ecosystem. Thank you, Tammy. Um, good information, Tammy. Thanks for adding that. Our next question is from Rachel. My parents live really close to Dual Lake and have been told their groundwater is contaminated. They have apple trees on their property. And while I've seen neighbors picking them and I'm assuming eating them, I'm wondering if they're not safe for human consumption. Has there been any testing of food grown in these areas? Thank you. I can uh, try to answer that one, Sue. Um, yeah, thanks for I can. I can look more into it I, and I can get back to you if, 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 that's, if that's fine. Yeah, Rachel, let us get back to you on that one. Yeah. And um, you know what, let me advance slides, just a couple here. Um, there's an email address at the bottom of this page. Um, I'm going to ask you to give us feedback on this meeting and that's the point of this slide. But it also has this email address, the mdhhs pfast at michigan.gov. And um, if you have questions or uh, you have continuing questions about something you've asked, you can email us there and we'll direct that to the right individual. Rachel, we'll look for your contact number. That's probably, yeah, that's true. And that's, this is Tammy. That's, I don't think Chris Kosmowski is on the phone tonight, but MDARD has an interest in that question as well. So we can make sure that it goes in that right direction. Right, thanks. Okay, a question from William. When will the latest DNR deer sampling be made available? Sorry, trying to get back to my mute button. This is Tammy again. I understand, um, Tammy. So, yeah, sorry. So we have um, we understand that the lab is wrapping up their work right now, and DHHS still will need to evaluate those results uh, before moving forward. So I'm hoping very soon. I um, so I, I can't give you an exact date, but we're looking at weeks right now, not months or, or even longer. So I'm saying. It, in weeks. Good to know. And then that information will be provided. And I'm assuming we'll post something on the um, MPART web pages when we are ready to do that. Yeah, that's co yeah, that's correct, Sue. What we normally do is provide a um, there'll be a report. 
MDHHS will um, take the lead on and then we will post it. And I'm sure we'll be talking about the results here um, probably even before we, we get that final report posting. Okay. Um, might be a good time to add that we're working toward getting back to quarterly or at least semi-regular meetings for this area. And um, that might be a report that might be available at the next meeting early winter, I'm assuming. All right, next question is from William. Why then is cancer not included in the do not eat criteria? Okay, um, I can answer that one. Um, this is because the health effects uh, that are mentioned there are those are the risk drivers and greater than the cancer risk. And can you tell me when you when you're saying do not eat criteria, can you send a link of that? Uh, I'm not sure which which uh, website you're referring to. Is that on Empath? And William, if you'd like to raise your hand, we can unmute you if you'd like to um, provide more information about your question now. William has his hand raised. Okay. Yeah. I uh, think. Oh. William, we're not we're not able to he hear you uh, clearly. Plus, do you have any ideas about that? I I do not. Um, okay. We have to try that again uh, later. Let me try so, that again. Okay. <laughs> um, if if you can't, I can definitely reach out to you uh, first thing tomorrow. Okay. If 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 you're not able to, uh, you know. William, do you want to give that one more try? Yeah, that's that's not working either. Um, how about um, yeah, no, we just we'll have to get back to William? Like you guys probably have to answer that one offline. I think. Yeah, we'll have to get back to you tomorrow. Sorry about that. Okay, a question from Kathy. We have requested a map of the area of concern. There was one issued in approximately 2016. Does this continue to be the defined area? And Kathy, are you talking about uh, the uh, an advisory area, do not eat advisory area, or something different? And if you'd like to raise your hand, we can. Oh, there you are. Les, are you unable to unmute Kathy? Yes, just a moment. Uh, Kathy. Hi, Sue. Uh, thank you. Yes, so the area of concern that uh, Panit was um, referring to when um, determining whether um, a residential well could be sampled, that's the area of concern that I'm, I'm referring to. And this is the only map that I've, I've seen. I am working with Amanda, uh, and I will get back to you on that. Uh, Amanda, do you have anything to add? Just that in, in general, the areas of concern would coincide with areas where we're doing further investigation. Um, so it would be areas that could be impacted by um, Wurtsmith uh, contamination, which would be on the west side of, of Van Anton Lake if there are any private uh, wells there. Um, and then there's an area that's, you know, there's a lot of unknowns associated with impacts on the southern end of Van Atten Lake. So that would probably be an area that we would consider uh, drinking water while sampling. And then um, the sites I mentioned in the Ascoda area um, discussion, uh, the Colbath Road area, the Pinecrest area that's north of uh, Ascoda area schools, uh, Loud Drive that runs along the, um, the um, northern edge of Van Etten Lake or eastern side of Van Etten Lake. 
Um, those are locations that we typically have been approving um, drinking water sampling and, and DHHS has been able to uh, include those in their study. Um, and then we are also considering, you know, if somebody has a concern, um, we're considering um, other locations on a site by site basis. Okay, um, thank you, Amanda. I, uh, the reason I ask is that there's been some residents that uh, believe that they are in an area concern and they're you know, being told that they need, to per they need to pay for their residential well sample. So um, you know, if whatever method um, that they can pursue to um, have that considered um, being taken care of, uh, we would like to uh, pursue that. Right, and, and have them feel free to reach out to Puneet or I, and, and we typically discuss um, the various locations that make requests and, and determine if we, we think there's a likelihood of um, impact or concern that we should be looking at. Okay. Yep, yeah, have them reach out to me or Amanda, and yep, yeah, we'll get back to them. As soon as Thank possible. you. Sure. Wish I I think this has answered the comment from Clinton, who's asking about Lakeview Drive off Colbath Road on the northeast end of Ennett Lake. So Clinton, if you um, would like to reach out to Puneet or Amanda, and you can either do that by sending an email to this MDHHS address. Let me pop up. Um, here's Amanda's email address. And then I have others on the next slide, but I'll let you collect Amanda's there. All right, uh, Connie wants to know, for the 2018 sediment sampling in the Asable and Lake Huron, did you take one to two foot, five foot, or 10 foot sediment cores, or did you only collect surficial sediment cores? Mike, is this a question for you? Yes, it is. So those uh, were zero to two and a half feet. We took samples at the top six inches, bottom six inches, and then Mike, I think we lost you. Mike, we can't hear you. Yeah, my system dropped. Okay. Can you yeah, repeat that? Yeah, so, please? sure. Uh, we collected from zero to two and a half feet in most locations. There were a couple locations where we had poor recovery and we only had a foot of core sample. But for those that were two and a half foot, we collect, we sampled from the top six inches, the bottom six inches and the middle. And as I said, they were all non-detect, uh, likely due to the fact that uh, the bottom of the river and also out into the lake were all sand. There wasn't any real organic carbon there. So, uh, well, not unfortunately, but there was non-detect. And the samples were taken from the US 23 bridge to the uh, mouth of the river. Okay, thanks. All right, a question from Anonymous. Where can we access the information that tells us we are in the area of concern to receive free well testing? And also, will the north section of Loud Drive be getting city water connection? And if so, when? Uh, so part of that question, I think we've answered by uh, requesting people contact Amanda or Puneet. And let me flip to the next, oops, sorry, contact slide here. And then I don't know if we have anyone who can answer the question about Loud Drive getting uh, city water. This is Amanda. Um, I know that Osco to Township has submitted a proposal for a um, phased installations that are um, wanted to, they want to install over the next four years. And I, I would need to look at that plan to verify whether or not um, the northern portion of Loud Drive is included. I know the portion from Phelan Creek south was just installed, um, but I cannot remember if the portion north of Phelan Creek was included in Oscoda Township's proposal. So feel free to reach out and, and I can um, get back to you if you send me your information. Um, but uh, one thing I do want to add is that um, we really haven't identified significant contamination north of Phelan Creek. So that would be one reason if it's not proposed why it isn't proposed. Okay. 
A question from William. Is there a plan to update do not eat slash frequent frequency of consumption data in light of MCL data publishing and more recent research on PFAS effects? Quinny, do you want me to read that one yeah. again? Uh, no, I'm, I'm good. Sorry, it's just okay. uh, Zoom is behaving a little weird to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we'll be evaluating that uh, for appropriate updates. Uh, that's the only thing I can say right now. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question from Jenny. Will the slides be available for review after the meeting? And um, Beth and Amanda, I'm assuming that these uh, slides will be posted on the uh, investigation pages on the import website. Yes, that's the plan. Okay. Uh, so for those of you who have not visited the MPART website, it's michigan.gov slash um, PFAS response. And we do have it on the slide here. And um, if you go to the investigations button, it will drop down to all of the PFAS sites that are in the state. And if you scroll down the page, there is what looks like uh, an Excel file sort of. And if you click on the county button, it will sort the PFAS sites by county. And it's an easy way to find the sites that you're looking for and then find information about that site. And that's at, again at michigan.gov slash PFAS response. And um, while you bring that up, Sue, just, just a quick comment um, regarding the OSCO to area sites. They're actually named out separately. Um, so you might not see something that just says OSCO to area. You may see a site that's called OSCO to area schools, another one that's called Colbath. Um, and I just wanted to let people know that the information on the quarterly sampling that we've been doing, we're um, generating in a summary report for that, and we will be posting that on the MPART webpage. So people who wanted to see those individual results for those different OSCO to area sites, um, there, a report will be put together and posted for that. Okay, and while I've got you, Amanda, there's a question from Connie. When it, what is Eagle and DHHS doing to address the high concentrations shown on the slide with the school and surrounding neighborhood? So that is an area, um, the school itself was hooked up to municipal water um, already. The neighborhood across the street is an area that um, drinking water well sampling is approved for. So those homeowners um, can have their wells tested and they also have filters available to them. So if they live within that area, they are approved for filters um, and, and can reach out to their local health department to get those. And I and, just want to add, oh, go, go, go ahead, Amanda. Oh, it's just the last thing I was gonna say is it's also an area that's um, within Asquita Township's future plans to install municipal water eventually. Okay. And just Thank one you. thing to add, uh, filters were also provided uh, there a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. All right, and Rex says, to answer the question on membership on the Restoration Advisory Board, there are nine community members appointed by the Air Force, along with eight governmental representatives. Kathy Roosterbarth is one of the community members. I know we had that question earlier. So thank you, Rex, for providing that information. And we have a couple of questions here from Arnie. A question one is for Beth. With respect to the US, uh, to the Air Force's baseline risk assessment in RA scoping, wildlife sampling plans in Clark's Marsh screening criteria, et cetera, what protective screening slash protective criteria will RRD use before approval of the USAF plan? Hi, Arnie, thanks for the question. And, you know, right now, um, Eagle and Air Force and DHHS, we haven't discussed the risk assessment in depth yet. That's one of the upcoming meetings um, in the rest of October. and in November. So I guess stay tuned for more information on the risk assessment. Okay. Um, additionally, as those uh, BCT meeting minutes from the scoping meetings become final, they'll be posted on uh, the Wurtsmith MPART site. And uh, just so folks know, it's kind of new, but we have the um, 
michigan.gov slash wurtsmith. So it makes it just a little bit easier to get there. So thank you. And question two from Arnie is, is the Purdue study designed to help RRD ensure USAF risk assessment is adequate? For example, EPA required US uh, Air Force sample wildlife in 2018 with a fish screening criteria of seven parts per billion in ESI phase. And so I'm gonna answer that first and then uh, Purdue can jump in or uh, DNR. And so to my understanding, no. Um, I know uh, Air Force has agreed to um, uh, any data that they can uh, receive, they'll definitely uh, evaluate if it's uh, timely for them. Um, but again, and the risk assessment hasn't been discussed in detail. Thank you. Okay. So um, Sue, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, it was, is the Purdue study designed to help RRD ensure um, the Air Force risk assessment is adequate? For example, EPA required the Air Force sample wildlife in 2018 with fish screening criteria of seven parts per billion in the ESI phase. Oh, okay. So I wanna make it very clear that the two things are not the Purdue study and the Air Force RRD and RRD issues are not they're, they're independent of one another. Again, when we came up with this question, uh, the wildlife work group through DNR and MPART, it was simply to help us think about the problem and how we looked at the ecosystem. It wasn't designed to do anything for anything other than give us a greater understanding. So of course, we will be sharing the data as appropriate with the Air Force as they need it. And the, data can get shared after the investigators have the opportunity to do their work and write it up and do the things that they need to do, uh, yes, will be shared. But the study itself was not conceptualized with any um, outcomes to be for any purposes other than building our knowledge base. All right, thanks, Tammy. Oh, um, and I just wanted to add a little bit more to that. Thank you, Tammy, I appreciate that. Um, Arnie, that last part of your question about um, the ESI and the fish levels, I don't believe that those numbers are applied to Wurtsmith. And again, the baseline and environmental uh, risk assessment will be in the discussed further in the remedial investigation scoping with Air Force and Eagle and DHHS. Thank you. Hey, Beth, so, while it, oh, go ahead. Sue, this is Les. Um, Arnie has his hand raised, and I didn't know if his two questions um, that were written addressed the question that he had. Okay. Um, I'm going to get back to Arnie in just a second. There was okay. a question that had gotten skipped, and while we've got Beth, this is a question for her, uh, I believe. Uh, where can I go to get an updated map showing the currently known extent of the plume radiating from the base? Sure, and so Air Force has completed an ESI and a site inspection investigation, and the information that they have is available on the Air Force administrative record. Both, both those reports are available on there, so plume information could come from there. In the past, Eagle has shared um, what we call heat maps that have dot locations that show kind of the general Wurtsmouth and Oscoda area, but really it's not, um, it doesn't show uh, plumes emanating from Wurtsmouth. So I hope that helps answer the question. Oh, and all past presentations are available on the um, michigan.gov slash Wurtsmouth. And if you click all Wurtsmouth document, which is now at the top of the page, that'll um, lead you to some of the Eagle documents. And then again, the Air Force administrative record also has several um, documents in there as well. Okay, Arnie, quickly, let's um, get to you and see if the, that answered your, your question. I see your hand is still raised. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay, um, Beth is right that uh, EPA was uh, numbers 
and screening for wildlife and fish was in at Pease Air Force Base in New Hampshire at their Superfund site. But it was screening levels so that the Air Force would sample the wildlife to see if they had any areas around the base that were above that screening level. And therefore they would be informed on where they would sample to do their baseline risk assessment. It is a criteria that applies to fish no matter where pretty much. So it just could be another screening, uh, a level of criteria that the Air Force could or should be asked to investigate as they're developing their risk assessment planning. So okay. that's what I was getting at. And somewhat related is Bill's question that he was not able to get back to you, to uh, Panit. And he was referring to the do not eat as part of the eat safe fish, uh, Eagle Department of Health uh, program. That's what he was referring to for the criteria of, I think it's 300 is a do not eat level for the fish and the deer. So that's what Bill was referring to. I'm pretty sure. Okay. Okay, thanks Darnie. All right, uh, Jenny would like to know, has visible PFAS foam been identified on Lake Huron? Eagle has not sampled any foams on Lake Huron. Okay. And that was Mike Jerry from Eagle. Now, next question from Connie. Uh, regarding PFAS sampling of surface water in Lake Huron, why not filter the surface water samples to eliminate the scum issue? Thanks for the question, Connie. I'm not a chemist, so I don't know how the effect of filtering uh, surface water samples would affect the PFAS concentrations. Um, but it's just our typical protocol is to sample below the, the sample the subsurface below the surface of the water. Okay. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, question from Tess. I read an article about birds being tested on the east coast of the United States. They found that as the PFAS levels increased in the birds, the uh, phospholipid levels in their liver decreased. The article mentioned that these fats are important for reproductive health, migration, raising their young successfully, and other elements of their life cycle. Have you found this to be true with the birds here as well? Could the plummeting migratory bird numbers be related to this? Tammy sounds like. Oh, Sue, this is Tammy. And ta yeah, that's a great question, Tess. Um, and I'm going to break it up a little bit. And first of all, say that um, PFAS has been tested in, in different birds in different places in the US, different water. So I don't know if that article was referring to waterfowl specifically or not. But waterfowl is of interest to us here in Michigan. We, our wildlife uh, work group has been working on a sampling plan to look at waterfowl. Part of the issue is their, their migratory nature and they don't stick around long in a single location. And so we've been wanting to make sure that whatever we set up, we're getting some information that's helping inform us rather than just sort of a random act of sampling of birds that happen to be in a particular place. Um, Unfortunately, the funding for that work um, was um, uh, rescinded with uh, COVID expenses this year. So we're working to try and seek some more funding to, act, to, to look at that very issue for waterfowl in Michigan. Um, I can't comment in terms of the plummeting migratory bird numbers because I, I, I think that's really specific to um, two different species. So I, and I, I definitely don't want to speculate anything to an overall population for a migratory flyway. 
Um, but I do want to say that that is in our radar and that's something that we want to look at in terms of understanding what PFAS levels may be in birds um, in Michigan that spend a good bit of time in surface water areas of concern. Thanks, Tess, for that question. That was a very interesting one. A uh, question from Anthony. For Wes or Mike Jury, there have been a number of surface water samples taken and reported from inland water bodies like Bennett and Lake. Does Lake Huron differ from these inland water bodies so much that the surface water can't be sampled? If yes, how so? So Tony, uh, the Eagle samples that uh, RRD has collected, we collected uh, scoop samples from the surface and um, a little bit below the surface. I can't answer why the surface water folks take theirs at one meter below, other than that is their procedure for doing it. The samples that we took along with the foam, foam samples, meaning that we took a co-located surface water sample, uh, we just took like you probably would. You take a bottle, stick it down there in the water below the surface and take the sample. We did not sample a meter below. That's their procedure. And so uh, I can't answer that. Uh, maybe as Brandon said, they have some reason why they do the things they do. And uh, we did what we did. Uh, probably not a very good answer, but that's the answer I have. All right. Um, Kathy has her hand raised. Let's go to Kathy. Hi, Sue. Thanks. Okay. Um, I, I um, attempted in this meeting to get um, Dean Wiltsey to do um, just an introduction of his company, um, just for the, um, the information actually for the state folks and for anyone who may not have heard the information. Um, I'm sorry, I should um, introduce myself. I'm Kathy Woosterbarth, and I'm, I'm one of the co-leaders of the Now Need Our Water Group um, in Oscoda. And um, I'll just take some ex ex excerpts from um, the, the news uh, article that uh, Dean did in our local paper. But um, he's saying that the Osco County residents will now be able to get their water tested for PFAS contamination locally by EnviroLab a new company owned and operated by Dean Wiltsey of Oscoda. EnviroLab is an offshoot of Wiltsey's um, EnviroBright Solutions Cleaning Supply Company operated out of the same location on the former uh, Worth Smith Air Force Base. He's teaming up with chemist uh, Gregory Rosenhauer. Wiltsey and um, Thomas York are hoping to offer fast and affordable water testing for uh, concerned residents. Not only are there limited labs that could do the testing, but it is a complicated process to collect the water, ship it across the state, and get the results back, all while residents are wondering if their water could be causing adverse health effects. Uh, some of these samples were taken upwards uh, of a month to get their results. These are the past samples. Um, normally, this test would be about $500 for drinking water, which is um, the highest standard and for local people um, in the county that have a concern that price is going to come down to about $150 for someone to find out if they're um, uh, and they're going to find out in in one day. We think that's got a huge public benefit is what Dean says. Um, and Bayer Lab is undergoing the accreditation process with the state of Michigan to en ensure that they can accurately identify contaminants and they're aiming for the highest accreditation to cover drinking water testing. And I also wanted to mention um, to Jenny, she had uh, asked about uh, foam testing uh, on Lake Huron. That is something that we've um, urged the state of Michigan um, to do um, because there's multiple sightings. Uh, for years, we've had sightings of uh, foam on Lake Huron and, and we, we want that tested. Um, so uh, we certainly are going to try to find a, a way to do that one way or the other. Um, and I believe it needs to be done immediately because as um, you know, they uh, described, it's the uh, source of our drinking water um, in our area. So it, it needs to be um, 
uh, identified if, if it is beef mass. And that's all I have, thanks. Okay, thanks, Kathy. Uh, somewhat related comment from, or question from Anonymous. Is it true that a private well testing alternative might be available out of Traverse City for wells both inside and outside of areas of concern that is a fraction of the cost of state PFAS testing? And the answer is yes, that company is known as Freshwater Future. If you type in Freshwater Future on your uh, search engine on your uh, internet, you should be pulled right to there. Ian, did you want to comment any further on that? Uh, no, thanks, Mike. I think you got it covered. All right, thanks, Mike. Uh, another question from Anonymous. Should I be concerned about my children swimming and or fishing in Benetton Lake? I can take this one, Sue. Mm -hmm. uh, for Benetton Lake, uh, based on the data, swimming is not a concern. And in case you come in contact with the foam, uh, try to rinse it off and completely avoid the foam. Uh, we have showers there uh, which are installed recently uh, to wash. And for fish, there are Eat Safe Fish Guides for Manhattan Lake uh, that you can follow. Okay. And again, the website with our Eat Safe Fish Guidelines is michigan.gov slash eat safe fish. Uh, if you uh, follow up on that too, there are um, additional guidance on the MPART site. So if you go in the PFAS uh, fish testing, there's uh, a link there that has all the content or all the guidance for different species from Van Etten Lake. Yeah, and it has um, the PFAS response webpage has the results, the guidelines for fish that have been sampled for PFAS. Um, there are some other guidelines for fish from Van Etten Lake. Um, that are not found on that website. So you can find the comprehensive list at uh, michigan.gov slash eat safe fish. But yes, there is information also available under that tab on the PFAS response webpage. Okay. Um, now just a Response to you, Puneet, from Arnie. He believes Bill's do not eat refers to the eagles to eat, say, fish nine to yes, 300. Yep. He mentioned eagles. it. Yep. Okay. Yep. Um, another question from Arnie. How important and how important are the upcoming deer PFOS results and timing in RRD's review? of the Air Force's RI scope and sampling plan to support their baseline risk assessment. So this is Tammy, that's a that's a Beth question because it's a process question and I, I don't fully understand the RRD's view. Right. Yeah, uh, this is Beth and um, I mean, Air Force has agreed to um, evaluate the state of Michigan data for use in um, the remedial investigation and uh, risk assessment. And so when those deer results come in, um, I imagine Air Force would be interested in, in seeing them. But I don't think you know, if they're not in in the next month, I don't necessarily think that that's uh, that means that they won't be used or or something like that. So, basically, Air Force has agreed to um, evaluate our data when it comes in, and I know that again we still plan to discuss the risk assessment in October and November, and additionally we've kind of tossed around the idea of potentially having a separate um, risk assessment work plan, but um, there's no final determination on that yet. So I hope that answers the question. And I will add that I know uh, Tammy Newcomb worked very hard to um, get that data analyzed during the uh, COVID 
So I really appreciate that, Tammy. Thank you. Beth, while we've got you, can you tell us what RRD stands for? Sure, uh, remediation and redevelopment. Okay, and then the RI? Uh, remedial investigation. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We're good at acronyms, I know. <laughs> All right, from Anonymous, uh, can Eagle plan to do a more robust sampling of PFAS foam and PFAS concentrations in Lake Huron to more fully understand the existence of PFAS over time in the Great Lakes and how people recreating on Lake Huron should be notified of potential PFAS foam or contamination? I think there's two parts to this question because we do have um, a statewide foam advisory that Puni can talk about, but maybe Eagle can talk about, uh, can give us an answer to the first part of this. So the question is about sampling foam and PFAS concentrations in Lake Huron. Hey Sue, it's Teresa, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, it's Teresa Seidel with Water Resources Division. We use foam as an indicator of where we should be looking for PFAS, not as um, an analytical component of it. So we know that if we sample foam, we'll likely find PFAS. But because it has no volume, it doesn't really serve us very well. So our purpose of looking for foam, and you can go to our the MPART page or onto Eagle's page, uh, web page, and identify anytime you see foam so that we can be looking for areas where we we're looking for to find PFAS, but to go and sample more foam um, when we know what the source likely is in this case, um, it, it just isn't a great use of our resources. So we try and use the things that are the tools that are already out there, such as MDHS's PFAS foam fact sheet, um, the incident response center through My Waters, where you can register that you've got a, you've seen foam and that helps us identify where we should be spending our resources on sampling. So in this case, we know what the source is. So it, it doesn't really benefit a lot by going out and sampling more foam. But if there are new areas where you see foam, um, we definitely would like to know those and you can go to our, our My Waters site and enter it in. Um, and during the foam complaint, there's actually a web page that'll tell you exactly how to do that. So it's a much simpler process than just calling us and telling us, you can just put it right on the page and then it goes right to staff and they can come out and check out other locations for foam. So we do wanna know about foam events, but we're really not looking to sample them for the foam itself, but we're looking for sources of PFAS. And Puni, can you talk about our statewide foam advisory? Hi, Sue. So this is Andrea Keatley with Michigan Department of um, Health and Human Services. I do believe Puneet um, got bumped off of Zoom for temporarily, and he's trying to get back on. Okay. Uh, as for our foam, um, we do have a statewide uh, message to avoid foam and to rinse it off after recreation. Right. And um, and we tend to issue press releases uh, around recreation season uh, statewide so people know about the statewide foam advisory and that would apply to Lake Huron as well. All right, from Anonymous, do the residents of Loud Drive have to pay for the connection to city water and if so, why? And I don't know that we have anyone on this call who can answer that question. Right, I, I'll just add that um, the funding source that was obtained to install the Loud Drive municipal line um, did not include individual hookups to homes. Um, that was unfortunate. Future phases of municipal line work um, that are proposed, um, it is anticipated that those hookups would be included as part of the the loan if it's approved to Osgoda Township, but um, I can't really explain why it wasn't included with the, the funding source that was obtained for the loud drive work. All right, thanks, Amanda. Um, Rex has let us know that Freshwater Future has suspended their PFAS testing program due to COVID restrictions imposed on the lab they use at the University of Michigan Biological Station in Pelston. So thanks for that information, Rex. Uh, from Kathy, 
please clarify, you believe the foam on Lake Huron has come from the uh, United States Air Force contamination? I, I wouldn't definitively say that. That's one of the reasons why we went out and did the high visit Teresa, by the way, why we did the additional sampling. And what we found were really low concentrations of PFAS in, in the Great Lakes. So, and, and we see low concentrations of PFAS across a lot of lakes at small numbers. So to see foam, it could either be naturally occurring, it could be just picking up the surfactant from the PFAS itself. So we're still gonna do investigations um, throughout the area as we continue to collect samples. It's just that going out and collecting foam off of the lake when we already know there's PFAS concentrations in the lake doesn't really gain as much. So we wanna be looking for those sources. So if you see foam in an area um, that's different, that's good to know. I sent Matt Tomlinson um, the link and hopefully he can throw that in the chat so you can see how to uh, locate the, the My Waters link so we can get the information to do more investigation when you see foam on different water bodies or in different places on Lake Huron. All right, thanks, Teresa. From Anonymous, recently the water in Venant Lake has been a neon green color with small particles floating in it. Is this a sign of PFAS contamination? And I know um, Puneet, is he back on the line or? Well, I think it's Mike. Yeah, that Charlie can answer that uh, yeah. and talk about algae. Yeah, uh, this is Charlie Bauer. I'm with Water Resources Division, uh, District Supervisor out of Bay City. Um, those, uh, neon, that neon green color um, is likely due to algae blooms, uh, which is natural to lakes with uh, higher phosphorus levels. Uh, if you see small particles, it might be uh, actually duckweed, um, which is uh, actually very common um, on lakes and on slow moving water bodies. Uh, so that is not typically associated with PFAS at all. It's associated with phosphorus. All right. Um, Jake from Congressman Kildee's office uh, stating he can answer the hookups. So can we unmute Jake, please? All right, this is Jake. Can you hear me now? We can hear you, Jake. All right. Sorry, I'm in the car picking up my daughter. But the, uh, the USDA grant that we were able to get for the hookups can only be used on public right of ways. That is why the service line, once it gets from the service line to the house, it is against the federal regulations to use that federal funding for that. So for the houses that they were able to get funding for, that funding came from the state of Michigan. They were hoping to get extra funding for phase two and further, but unfortunately because of COVID what happened, the state tightened their belts and they stopped sending some of the money out to some of the other things to take care of COVID from what I've been told. But that's why the USDA grant that we were able to get boosted to a million dollars can only go to the public right of way, the service line, and cannot go to the private property service line. That's why. Uh, thanks, Jake. Yeah, that's uh, provides a lot of clarification. Appreciate that. Uh, uh, from Anonymous, I think there's a very big disconnect with the public and the agency's assertion that people truly understand that foam on water indicates PFAS. I think there's a statewide foam advisory, but I think there needs to be a much more robust communication strategy that's placed, place-based, signs at beaches, particularly for Lake Huron. So two parts to this, um, someone, and maybe Mike, I don't, someone from Eagle maybe can talk about foam on water doesn't necessarily mean it's PFAS foam. There are different types of foam. Mike, is that something you could talk about or someone from Eagle could talk about? And then I will talk, we can address the sign issue. Oh uh, yeah, this is Charlie Bauer again. I can talk about the, the foam. So um, there is a naturally occurring uh, lake foam. Uh, it's a natural phenomenon when you have um, the breakdown of uh, plant matter, it develops basically a surfactant, a soapy material that when the wind uh, whips the waves, 
It whips up a foam. It's a natural foam. Um, PFAS is also has a surfactant uh, effect as well. Um, there is some uh, potential uh, differentiation, visual differentiation uh, related to those foams, but um, lake foams are common. Uh, they're common everywhere. They can be obviously uh, contributed to by F PFAS as well, um, but there are areas all over the Great Lakes that have lake foam issues uh, that don't have sources of PFAS. So uh, it's uh, a matter of, uh, as Teresa was saying, understanding that this area, like Lake Van Etten, for example, has uh, sources of PFAS and therefore uh, it's more likely that that foam uh, could come from that source and then dealing with the source. Um, we know that in uh, Lake Huron, at least based on the sampling we've done, the PFAS levels are very low uh, right now. And we know that uh, lake foam uh, occurs all across the Great Lakes. So it can be natural, it can be PFAS, um, but there isn't a, a clear way to say this is uh, an issue. I think that Sue maybe um, with regard to, I think this question is more with regard to um, a health issue, a health concern. So. I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, and I am going to toward, we're almost done. And I want to give you a little tour of the PFAS response webpage to show you where to find foam information and maybe some other information. Um, we do have signs posted in some locations around the state. There are signs posted at Bennett and Lake, um, at the DNR campground on the lake. At, so at, um, at Air Force Park, at the DNR campground, and the YMCA campground. Uh, so there are foam signs posted there. We have foam signs posted on the Huron River and on Lake Marguerite and Grayling. I'm trying to recall all the sites. So there are signs at some locations where we found uh, very high levels of PFAS in foam, just advising that people avoid the foam and rinse it off after if they do get into the foam. And again, that shower has been installed at Air Force Beach now. Um, if you have ideas for us on how to uh, supplement our communication on foam or other topics, I suppose, but foam in particular, uh, feel free to drop us an email at that MDHHS hyphen PFAS uh, email inbox. And uh, we'd like to hear your ideas and thoughts. But yeah, we do have foam signs posted in some locations around the state. Uh, okay, our last question, and it's from Arnie. A question for Mike Jury. When will Eagle's foam study be released? It's under peer review. It's being peer reviewed by uh, professors at Michigan State, Western Michigan University, by the state of Minnesota and Wisconsin. As soon as I get their responses, they'll be given to AECOM. Uh, they'll fix the document. Uh, there have been some, I found some typos in it, a couple other problems with it that uh, they have to fix, but we're waiting on the rest of the peer review information to come in. So putting a hard and fast date on it, Arnie, is kind of hard. Uh, I'm at the mercy of these uh, folks from the other places. I've asked them, you know, get your stuff in. So uh, I don't want to do a disservice to anybody by putting out a document that has any kind of uh, flaws in it. So uh, be patient, it will come out. All right, and a question for Beth. Has RRD discussed with the Air Force in the last year the very high PFOS concentration in surface water foam? Has Michigan requested that RI phase work plan include character characterization of surface water foam? Yes, so Air Force is certainly aware that there is uh, PFAS in the foam on Van Etten Lake. Um, but no, we have not asked Air Force to um, characterize the foam during the remedial investigation. 
Okay. I will add that um, as a to be considered item and um, when Eagle identified ARARs, we did include the um, home advisory for uh, Van Ant Lake and Cedar Lakes. Although Cedar Lake is not included in uh, Wartsmith contamination that just happened to come out together. Thank you. Okay, and we have a, a comment from Tony. Given that some foams have PFAS and some don't, there's a public health issue that needs to be addressed at Lake Huron and other lakes. Given the volume size of Lake Huron, it's misleading to suggest that PFAS levels in Lake Huron are low. Thanks for sharing that, Tony. I, that's the end of our questions. Thank you, everyone. Those were really Sue. great questions. Um, Sue? Yeah. Mm. Could we get Greg's? His hand was up for a long time. Um, oh, I'm sorry. I have not seen that. Oh, I see William. Yeah, Greg's was up for a long time. So, so we'll get to him before. Oh, before out. I am sorry, Greg. I didn't see that. Please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, hi, my name is Greg Rosenhauer, and I'm the lab manager for EnviroLab Services on the Wordsmith Air Force Base. I just want to let everyone know that I am here and have been listening the whole time. Uh, and everything that Kathy said was correct about our lab. I just wanted to jump in since she introduced us. And I will be sending out my contact information after the meeting. And um, in regards to the foam on Lake Huron, we've actually tested this foam. And uh, we, of course, found PFAS in the foam, although I wouldn't exactly classify it as PFAS foam since the levels were not extremely high. And since there is PFAS in the water, it, of course, is going to accumulate in the foam. But they weren't extremely high levels. I wouldn't say that, uh, that the PFAS is causing the foam. It's probably a naturally occurring foam where the PFAS is accumulating. So that's all from me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Greg. Um, and Clinton. Clinton has a hand raised. Clinton's hand is um, I just, um, unmute, unmuted. So he just has to unmute on his end. OK. Clinton, go ahead, please. Okay, maybe they changed their mind. I don't know. <laughs> okay. okay. You think of it, Clinton, let us know. Um, yeah. All right. Thanks. No more hands. No more hands are raised. No more no. hands. No more questions. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, I am going to attempt to share my screen and um, just share some information with you that's on the MPART uh, webpage in case you haven't been there. Um, and I'm not sure that you're seeing it. Yeah. Are you seeing the MPART webpage now? Yes. Thank you. OK. Uh, so this is the michigan.gov slash PFAS response webpage. And you'll see the different tabs across the top. In case you haven't been here before, I just wanted to point those out. This tab has information about uh, foam and PFAS. And if you click on PFAS, um, foam and lakes and streams, that's where you'll find information about PFAS foam, naturally occurring foam, where advisories have been issued, uh, lots more information there about foam. And Brandon mentioned there's information available about PFAS and fish and wildlife. So you can find that under that tab here. I did want to mention that the Great Lakes Summit is coming up. And that is going to be held October 26th through 30th. It's all next week. It will be held virtually. And there is a slight cost for uh, some attendees. It's waived for local units of government. And so if you're interested in learning more about all sorts of topics related to PFAS, the agenda is posted here as well. That might be something you're interested in attending. Sue, um, yeah. just a reminder to our attendees that the registration deadline ends at the end of the day on Thursday, October the 22nd. Okay. Thanks for pointing that out. 
And uh, if you're ever interested in knowing where um, public meetings are going to be held, um, you can find the calendar here. The RAB meeting is tomorrow. If you're interested, uh, you can find the information here. You can register to attend um, that meeting here as well. It is open to the public. And um, maybe mention yeah. the PFATS sites tab is right there as well, Sue. Right next so to if you comment. go to investigations and go to PFAS sites, you'll find all of the PFAS sites in the state here. And if you click on county, it will sort the PFAS sites by county. So you can scroll down to whichever county um, you're looking for. And the names of the sites are here, city, county. And then um, you would be able to go down to Iosco County. And this is where the sites in the Ascoda area are listed. So that's another easy way to, um, to get to the information you're looking for in particular to Ascoda. On the Wurtsmith page, for instance, you can click on that all Wurtsmith documents um, button that I believe Amanda mentioned or Beth mentioned and uh, lots of materials here. And then also this meeting uh, will be posted on the on the page as well after uh, I believe Les, you'll send it away for transcription, correct? Yes, uh, the meeting is being recorded. It will be sent out for um, for, for closed captioning. And um, once that's back, it will be posted. Actually, it will probably be posted uh, before the closed captioning is back, but um, you, we hope to have that available, the video available within the next day or so. And it'll initially be posted on Eagle's YouTube channel, uh, which I'll put, I'll put in the chat uh, for everyone. And then it eventually be um, on the Impart page shortly okay. thereafter. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, you have seen these links for a little bit now. I had that screen up for a while. So the Impart website is where we just were the Eat Safe Fish Guidelines, and then more information from the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, which we work closely with. I talked about the RAB meeting, showed you how to sign up for that, and then also the Great Lakes uh, Summit, PFAS Summit. And if you're interested in giving us feedback about this meeting, if you'd like to tell us if you received the information you needed or what might have made this meeting better for you, drop us an email at that MDHHS PFAS um, at that inbox. So we appreciate feedback from you. Uh, I did have these contact slides up for a bit. Hope you got those if you needed them. And we would like to thank all of you for spending your time with us this evening. Uh, it's been nearly two and a half hours and we greatly appreciate your time. All of your great questions and the comments that you provided to us. Uh, we will get back with you on dates for the next meeting, uh, which will likely be after the holidays. But uh, be safe, be well, and enjoy those holidays as best you can. Thank you, everyone.